On behalf of the Markula Center for Applied Ethics, we are excited to have everyone tuning in today to join us for this Get Vaccinated webinar. During the next half hour, we will be discussing the FDA approval process for COVID-19 vaccinations and what lingering vaccine myths um, may be stopping people from getting vaccinated. To introduce myself, my name is Amana Liddell and I will be hosting today's webinar. I am a senior at Santa Clara University um, and I am majoring in biology and psychology. For the last couple of months, I've been working with the Ethics Center to help with this Get Vaccinated webinar series. Um, to introduce our guests for today's webinar, our guests for today's FDA approval and lingering vaccine myths webinar is Professor Katherine Saxton. Professor Saxton is an epidemiologist and associate professor of biology and public health at Santa Clara University. After receiving her bachelor's degree from Brown University, she earned both her master's of public health and PhD from UC Berkeley. You may even recognize her from Santa Clara's Instagram story series, Ask Professor Cat, where she answered questions about COVID-19 vaccinations and the university's COVID-19 policies. Professor Saxton, thank you so much for joining us today. We are very excited to have a chance to hear from you. Thanks, Amana. It's great to be here. To start us off, um, could you tell us the difference between the emergency use approval um, and the full FDA approval process? Sure. So the basic difference is that the emergency use approval process is intended to give faster access to vaccines or medications in an emergency situation, right? So um, it's a process that's only been around um, for about 20 years, and it allows the FDA to provide access to, in this case, vaccines while they're still being studied. That said, the approval, the authorization process under the emergency use authorization program is still pretty extensive and requires a lot of clinical trials and testing and safety information. Um, to move from emergency use authorization, which is really limited to the time period of the health emergency, right? So in theory, the EUAs would all end when COVID is over and this emergency has passed. That seems to be continuing longer than we had hoped, um, but it's intended as sort of a time limited approval process. And then vaccine manufacturers and the FDA can continue to collect and review data during that period, eventually hopefully leading to full authorization. Great. And so then could you kind of explain the process that the COVID-19 vaccines have um, undergone um, in order to ensure their safety? Because I know that now um, the one of the vaccines is does have that full FDA approval um, while others still have the emergency use approval. Yes. Um, I will also just say that it's only a matter of time until the other ones do receive full authorization, that reviewing all of the massive amounts of data takes some time and um, the FDA is doing that carefully. So um, we will, I fully expect to see full authorization before too long. Um, that said, so for emergency use authorization, um, the standard is that the vaccine is, seems to be effective in preventing COVID-19, that the benefits outweigh the risks, and that there aren't any alternatives. Uh, that's the, the emergency piece. Um, and so to get there, vaccine manufacturers you know, first go through the sort of laboratory-based development phases, um, and then even for emergency use authorization, they have to go through up through phase three clinical trials, um, which means in phase one, they're testing for safety on a small number of people, make, making sure the vaccine actually elicits an immune response. In phase two, they're up to sort of hundreds of people and a wider range of people, again, mostly testing for safety and whether it's um, activating your immune system. And then phase three trials are really the key. And these are when Vaccines are tested on thousands of people. For Pfizer, it was over 40,000 people. And you're testing for 
effectiveness of the vaccines? Do they work in real people, in real life, in real contexts? Um, and these trials are also large enough to test for relatively rare side effects. So they really provide some great information about safety and effectiveness. All of that is required for emergency use authorization. So the fact that these vaccines, except for Pfizer, are not fully approved doesn't mean that they've gone through shortcuts or um, haven't gone through the full sort of clinical testing process. And I think that brings up a really important point because safety is a large concern when these vaccines have the emergency use authorization as opposed to the full FDA approval. And that's definitely been a large concern for a lot of people um, that's kind of served as a barrier for them um, making that step to getting the COVID-19. So I think that Pfizer having that full FDA approval has shown um, some increase in vaccination numbers um, to for people to have that additional confidence while we do know that the vaccines with the emergency use authorization are safe, um, just still working their way through that approval process. Um, And so going on, as I mentioned, a large concern about the COVID-19 vaccines is that they were developed really quickly. And because of that, that they um, may have shortcutted on safety. Um, But what unique circumstances allowed for the rapid development Um, of COVID-19 vaccines where they are still safe and effective? So this is a really great question uh, because the circumstances under which the COVID-19 vaccines were developed are sort of unique in our experience with vaccines. Uh, To put it very simply, it was a lot of money that was thrown into this and there were a lot of cases to be prevented. Um, Usually, access to funding slows down the process, any research process. So the fact that the federal government sponsored so much of this research up front and vaccine development and um, Operation Warp Speed really did make a difference in the ability of um, researchers to um, reach their conclusions and create the vaccine. But also when you're testing for vaccine effectiveness, you, and the same is true for a medication, you need to see a certain number of cases to show that it works. So you need to prevent a certain number of cases to show vaccine effectiveness. Okay, so when you're doing a clinical trial and you're comparing the number of cases or hospitalizations in the vaccinated group versus the unvaccinated group, if no one's getting infected and no one's getting sick, you can't tell if it's working. In the context of a pandemic, where there's high transmission, lots of cases, uh, you reach those numeric targets for vaccine effectiveness much more quickly. You can see if it's working over a much shorter period of time than you normally would. Um, So those factors combined allowed these clinical trials to progress pretty quickly. Um, And the other piece I'll just add is that, and we talk, we've heard a lot about this new technology, mRNA vaccines are new and happen fast, and um, that's sometimes a concern, but the technology that underlies those vaccines has been under development for years. And so this sort of influx of um, motivation, worldwide collaboration, the urgency of a pandemic, and the funding and transmission pieces Uh, sort of allowed that technology that was being developed to be turned into effective vaccines over a much shorter time period than we would have otherwise seen. And really understanding kind of the circumstances in which we were able to make these vaccines happen um, is very important for kind of understanding that they are safe and still effective. um, And that a lot of time and research and money has gone into this process to be able to make it happen in a way that is safe and effective for everyone. Um, additionally, um, on another note, um, a large pharmaceutical company has asked the FDA to approve a new antiviral treatment in the form of a pill. Um, could you explain how this new COVID-19 treatment, or could you explain this new COVID-19 treatment and how it could impact the course of the pandemic? Yeah. So one of the things I've been frustrated by, and I'm sure lots of people working in healthcare have been too, is the challenge of treating COVID-19 illness. Um, And we've learned a lot, um, but it's been 
a, a huge challenge. The current, currently the only sort of approved antiviral for COVID-19 is treatment for COVID-19 is um, approved for people who are hospitalized. It seems to be effective in helping their recovery, but it requires an injection and requires your disease to be relatively more advanced. So it has limited use and widespread efforts. This new treatment uh, is could be really could really make a big difference. It's an antiviral pill, and um, which means that just the the way you take it makes it so much more accessible and easier for people to um, come by and manage. And the way it works is that you take it soon after symptoms start. And so before disease has become severe and it stops the virus from replicating inside of your cells. So it interferes with viral replication, therefore reducing the amount of the virus that you have to fight off and sort of, um, helping your body prevent illness and prevent more serious complications. Um, so it could be accessible to a whole lot more people easier to take, and because it works earlier in the course of disease, could make a really big difference and keep people out of the hospital in the first place. And I think that's a very important important point of all of the, uh, both the COVID vaccines and this new treatment is the idea of keeping people out of the hospital or preventing them from getting severe cases of COVID-19. I think that's one thing with the vaccine um, that we've seen now that booster shots are um, becoming available um, but the conversation about the general population getting their booster shots um, is that while protection against infection may be slightly waning, um, it's the protection against severe COVID-19 and hospitalizations that is still staying steady um, in vaccinations, which that helps us keep hospital capacities lower um, and prevent um, deaths from COVID-19. Absolutely. Yeah, that's an important point. And so now if we kind of um, transition into talking about some of these lingering vaccine myths um, that might be stopping people from getting vaccinated, um, I know that many people are concerned about the effects that COVID-19 um, may have on fertility. Um, could you speak to what we know about the effect of COVID-19 vaccines on fertility? Sure, I'll keep it short and simple. COVID-19 vaccines do not affect fertility, period. Very simple. Um, another one um, along that same lines is, is it advised for pregnant or breastfeeding women to get the COVID-19 vaccine? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and I'll say this is close to my heart. I have a kid who was born in June of 2020. So um, at the um, earlier days of the pandemic, um, but Yes. So pregnant women are at increased risk if they do get infected. Um, COVID-19 can be more severe. It can lead to um, birth complications and um, uh, challenges with the pregnancy. And COVID-19 vaccination, like other vaccines in pregnancy, is safe. So it provides protection for a group of people who are more at risk um, and so the CDC and other groups have been recommending and sort of encouraging women to get vaccinated. And uh, there's a lot of concern and misunderstanding and people wanting to be cautious when they're pregnant. Um, but just like you get your flu shot when you're pregnant, um, COVID-19 vaccination is safe and important and protective. Yes. But Yesterday I saw a article from the Guardian, Guardian that was talking about how one in six um, unvaccinated people that are in the ICU right now with COVID are pregnant, um, which is just a very unfortunate statistic um, when you think about it in the large picture, when we do have vaccines that are readily available um, that could help prevent many of these cases. Absolutely. And the other piece of your question about um, breastfeeding, again, it's safe, it's effective, it's important. Um, some antibodies may be passed through breast milk to the infant, which can provide them some sort of passive protection, at least during breastfeeding. Um, and since vaccines aren't available for such little kids yet, 
um, that is an added benefit. Um, and again, safe, effective, encouraged, no downside. Mm-hmm. Another um, common question about the COVID-19 vaccine is if someone has had COVID-19 in the past, do they still need to get the vaccine? And um, if so, why? Yeah. So the vaccine provides much better protection than an infection. Um, the Partly because of the sort of level of antibody response, but also because the vaccines seem to protect against um, more variants rather than just the particular strain that you are exposed to if you were infected. Um, but the vaccines provide longer lasting, more durable, more effective immune responses than our natural response. Um, and it certainly doesn't hurt anything. There's actually some research research that suggests that people who've both been infected and then get the vaccine have like super immunity, but it's higher than people who just get the vaccine alone. Uh, so yes, um, it is important and safe to get vaccinated, even if you've already been infected. Thank you. Um, and so with the Delta variant, that's kind of the, um, variant that we are currently battling and the, um, one that we have probably talked about most over the course of the pandemic, given, um, its impact on how COVID is spreading and how rapidly that spread is occurring. Um, will the vaccine still protect us against these different variants, um, as the longer this pandemic goes, the greater the chances for more variants to arise. So far, so good. Um, vaccines are protecting us from all the variants that we've seen so far, um, including Delta. The challenge with Delta is that it's so much more infectious. People are so much more contagious that it spreads much more quickly, but the vaccines are still effective. Um, and it's so it's not spreading more because the variant is evading the vaccines. It's just people are more infectious. Um, The challenge is that the longer this goes on and the longer there are large percentages of people around the world who are not vaccinated, the more likely new variants are to arise. And one of those might find a way around the vaccine. So vaccines are working now. We need to take we should hopefully take advantage of that to try to vaccinate larger portions of the population globally. Yeah, um, that also brings up kind of a good point of, um, of a concern that people have with getting vaccinated right now is the idea of people who are vaccinated still getting infected with COVID-19. Um, could you speak to um, kind of those breakthrough cases um, how and why they occur, um, and how, why it's still important to get vaccinated despite that. Yeah. So, um, it's a little bit unclear why or in who breakthrough infections are most likely it's, people are researching it. Uh, I think the most important piece is that in these breakthrough infections, if you've been vaccinated and you still get infected, disease is probably much milder it's less likely that you'll be hospitalized. It's less likely that you'll be uh, sort of have severe disease. Uh, symptoms are not nearly so bad. So it's still, vaccines are still sort of doing their job in protecting from the most serious consequences of infection. Um, and there was also, there was some research early on in this the breakthrough infection conversation showing that People, regardless of vaccination or not, people were sort of equally infectious if they got infe- if they got the virus, and that turned out to not really be entirely accurate. Um, so a lot of people jumped on it and were like, "Oh, well, if I'm if I can keep spreading it regardless, then what's the point of getting vaccinated?" But um, if you're vaccinated and you get infected, you clear the virus out much more quickly. So you spread it for a much shorter period of time than people who are not vaccinated. Um, And so I think that's just an important point of clarification that breakthrough infections lead to less serious disease and make people less infectious. And overall, people who are vaccinated are less likely to get infected 
in the first place. Um, so vaccines are not perfect, but they're pretty darn good. Yes. And I think that's something that's been pretty transparent um, since the vaccines kind of started coming out is while they have 94, 95% efficacy, that's not a hundred percent. And there really is no vaccine that is perfect. Um, and so those breakthrough cases are something that is expected and anticipated, but there's the vaccine is still providing you with protection. That is very important um, in the case that you still got infected despite being vaccinated. Exactly. And I think also early on when fewer people were vaccinated, that 94, 96%, you weren't seeing very many of those other folks. Those breakthrough cases are really rare. As we get more millions and millions and millions of people vaccinated, those few breakthrough infections appear to be much more common, right? A small percent of a large number of people uh, looks like a lot of people. Very much. And I think this kind of also goes to kind of the unique circumstance that allowed the um, vaccinations to be developed quickly um, from the sheer numbers perspective of just the number of cases, because now we are at a point where things are um, very much so more open than they were when vaccines were first coming out. And so with that um, increased contact in people going to concerts and different things that at the very beginning of the pandemic and in the middle before vaccines were coming out or just coming out were very um, risky and um, kind of prohibited events and things that people weren't supposed to be doing that are now starting to happen more and more. Um, that puts us in a much different situation um, than we once were. It does, absolutely. Um, and so my next question is, um, why is it important for people who have still who have been vaccinated to continue following masking and social get distancing guidelines? So um, there are a lot of public health people who are very frustrated by the messaging that oh, you get vaccinated, you can just go back to normal. You're good now. Um, that sort of you are protected, and so you don't have to do anything else. Um, because that's not how pandemics work. That's not how infectious diseases work. Um, First of all, breakthrough infections are possible, even if they're less severe, they can happen. Um, and it is best to try to avoid those. So masks and social distancing still help. Um, especially if you are exposed to a lot of people at work, at school, um, if sort of your risk of being around someone else who's infected um, is increased, or if you are in contact with friends, family, housemates um, who are vulnerable, right? You wanna sort of do everything you can to protect those in your bubble. Um, but also I think it's important from a social responsibility point of view and social norms. Um, masks are one of the easiest things we can do to prevent the spread of an airborne virus, right? Um, and it may be sort of annoying or irritating, but wearing a mask really, it makes a huge difference. And the more people who wear masks indoors, the more effective they are, right? It's not just about you, it's about sort of the, the total number of people who are masking. Um, and as a side benefit, um, all of these precautions that we're taking with regards to COVID seem to be reducing other infections that are spread through the air as well. And so as we go into sort of cold and flu season and other viral infections, um, those, those same precautions can help protect us from multiple diseases. And I think the idea of it kind of being bigger than us and also um, benefiting others in the community kind of goes back to our first webinar was titled um, Love Your Neighbor and Get Vaccinated. Um, and just the idea of it's not only about us, but it's also about the people who are in our bubbles or um, the people that we're interacting with at work or at school and things like that. And I think especially um, while we still don't have um, vaccines that are available for children um, and things like that, um, it's especially important that we are doing what we can as people who are eligible to get vaccinated. We can wear masks um, to do our part um, in protecting those who don't have all of those same options. Um, but hopefully vaccinations in pediatric populations will be um, coming very, very soon. 
Um, also, there are some people who, for medical reasons, can't get vaccinated, right? So they're vulnerable. They can't do as many things to protect themselves and sort of our social responsibility, I think, to look out for them as well. Absolutely. Um, another, we kind of touched a little bit on the MRNA vaccine technology. Um, could you explain um, a little bit about the mechanism of the COVID-19 vaccines um, that use that technology and um, kind of elaborate on whether the COVID-19 vaccine alters our DNA? Sure. Um, it does not alter our DNA and mRNA technology for vaccines is really cool. So uh, mRNA is essentially a little set of instructions for your cells to make a protein. So when the vaccine provides your cells with these instructions, they make your cells go ahead and make the spike protein, which then elicits an immune response. You make antibodies, uh, make memory, T cells, B cells, um, and you're sort of preparing your immune system for when you see those proteins attached to the virus. mRNA goes away very quickly. It doesn't stick around. Um, you make the proteins and the mRNA degrades and it's, it's no longer there. Um, it does not affect your DNA. It just sort of takes advantage of your protein making machinery in your cells. Um, and I mean, people get concerned about the fact that your cells are making a viral protein, but if you think about how the virus works, the virus like takes over your whole cell to replicate itself. It becomes a little virus making factory. Um, so this is trying to prevent that from happening. Um, but regardless, it's not doing anything to your DNA. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and so as we kind of get to our last couple of minutes, do you have any final thoughts that you would kind of like to share um, in regards to the FDA approval process or lingering vaccine myths? I'll just say in general, the FDA approval process, the emergency use authorization process, these vaccines have been tested extensively. Um, there are sometimes concerns that side effects or consequences of the vaccines will show up much later, but, and we like, maybe haven't studied these long enough, but vaccine side effects and adverse effects of vaccines show up within the first month or two for all vaccines ever. So these vaccines have been around long enough. We would have seen serious consequences if they were to occur. Um, and they've been tested on so many people and now provided to so many millions of people around the world um, that I think we should have a lot of faith in their safety and effectiveness. And I think for, for people who may be having conversations with folks who are worried about vaccine myths or who, who are hesitant to get vaccinated, that people's concerns are real and people's hesitations come from a real place. And so being sort of thoughtful and responsive and talking to those friends or family members about why they're worried um, is often the most effective way to sort of break through those hesitations rather than there's been so much like, it's your fault if you're not vaccinated, um, blame and anger between folks who are vaccinated and vaccinated, um, which doesn't help anybody. So just a request to all of us to sort of be empathetic and compassionate when we're having these conversations. And I think that's a very simple thing that has kind of gotten forgotten or set on the back burner um, kind of throughout this pandemic. Um, Dr. Saxton, thank you again for joining us today and sharing all of this valuable information with our audience. Um, if you weren't able to tune into the entire event today or want to share the webinar with others, the recording will be available soon on the Mark Kula Center YouTube channel. Um, coming up next week in our series of Get Pack Vaccinated webinars, we'll be hosting our rescheduled um, webinar titled The Pandemic's Impact in Vaccination in Kids with Dr. Dow from Kaiser Permanente Santa Clara on October 21st. We will also be having um, Gary Spitko on October 28th, a professor at Santa Clara's School of Law that will be talking about what employees and employers should know about vaccine mandates and more legal questions related to the COVID-19 vaccinations. Um, in the meantime, I encourage you to visit the Get Vaccinated page on the Ethics Center website at scu.edu 
slash ethics slash get dash vaccinated for more information on the work that we are doing as part of this campaign to help get people vaccinated. Thank you all for tuning in today and we look forward to seeing you next time.